The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And new at 6, a man from El Salvador now facing a murder charge out of Hayes County. 19-year-old William Rojas has been charged in connection with the shooting death of 25-year-old Esbine Santiago Gomez from Guatemala. The shooting happened back on April 25th in Buda. Now, Rojas was original was actually already in the Travis County Jail on an unrelated charge. And on top of that, he's facing a number of charges in the death of Gomez murder and two counts of tampering with physical evidence. And we're told that he's going to be transferred to Hayes County to face those charges. Who would have thought that people would celebrate an empty lot? But that is exactly what happened today on the city's east side. Exactly. This morning, crews demolished the Twin Sisters Cantina Bar in Denver Heights. And if you remember, this place was actually declared a nuisance and a hazard back in February after dozens of shootings. We have done lots of stories. Yep. People who live and work in this neighborhood telling our Alicia Barrera that this has been a long time coming. It's a big day for the Denver Heights neighborhood. It's good to see this. That's something we're not going to have to worry about anymore. Twin Sisters East Cantina Bar is finally no more. It was a source of many issues, shootings, drive-bys, drunk drivers were generated from this property. All load has essentially disappeared ever since that happened. This is the moment many, including attorney Todd Taylor and his client, owner of the property, have been waiting for after a judge issued a temporary restraining order to close the doors of the bar in late January. And he had to do some pre-demo inspections. He had to engage some people, do some surveys. And then he uh, finally had to have the gas line removed. The green light to demo was given just this morning. And today's demolition came to a surprise, not only to officers, but to neighbors in the area as well. Many of them finally finding out the fate of this property as they drove by. Officer Michael Fisher says he's taking a piece of the rubble as a keepsake. It was a huge team effort between the city attorney's office, uh, code compliance, and especially the citizens. Um, they were extremely patient. Uh, their, their cooperation with me really helped get this done. As to what comes next. And whichever business, whoever owns it, I, I would say they're going to set the tone for the neighborhood. My client's plan is after he finishes preparing the property, he will put it back on the market for sale. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Attorney Todd Taylor confirmed that the person who ran that bar has been evicted. We tried to speak with that person several times, but he's declined each and every time. The city and San Antonio Police Officers Association have a new contract. The city council approving that today in an eight to three vote this afternoon. That contract will run through September 2026. It has numerous changes to officer discipline, most notably making it more difficult for fired officers to win their jobs back through the appeals process. The union president saying that none of their members want bad cops on the department. It makes the rest of us look bad that are doing our, our job correctly, due diligently. Um, so in this process, uh, I think we, we both came to an agreement that um, the outcome is we make sure we keep professionals here. And I think we accomplished that with this. There was a pretty emotional debate about this today. Some council members wanted to send the deal back to the negotiating table, hoping to make more changes. One issue raised by reform activists at council today was the desire for more power for civilian oversight. Now, SAPD does have a review board, but its recommendations for discipline are non-binding. New information now in connection with a deadly crash on the far west side from two days ago. We now know the name of the motorcyclist who was killed. The Bear County Medical Examiner says 32 year old Anthony Galvan was killed in that accident at Culebra and Alamo Parkway. That was Tuesday evening. According to police, a car was making a turn when Galvan's motorcycle slammed right into the side of that vehicle. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The driver of the car did not stop. And we don't know yet if that person did stop, excuse me, and is not expected to face charges. The Bear County Medical Examiner has identified at least one of the victims in a late night crash that killed two people on the south side. 21 year old Jaime Perez and a 19 year old woman died when their car overturned and then landed in water. This happened near South New Braunfels Avenue and Research Plaza. As Katrina Weber reports, it was people passing by that saw the accident and called police. Late night 911 calls had San Antonio police working to shed some light on what happened along this south side road. They found a Dodge Challenger partially submerged in what looks like a man-made pond near Research Plaza and South New Braunfels. 
Inside that car were a 21 year old man and a woman who police say both were dead. The callers who phoned police around 10 last night described this as a rollover crash. Markings left by investigators show the car appeared to have been heading east on Research Plaza when for some reason the driver lost control. The deadly path this car took is clearly mapped out in tread marks and red paint. You can see how it appears the car hit that tree before rolling over and landing in the water. At the scene, officers made no mention of other cars being involved, but the crash itself is still under investigation. The medical examiner staff had the tough job today of delivering this double dose of bad news to the relatives of the two people who were killed. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. News, another mess on a very familiar troublesome spot near downtown. This was overnight. Look at that, a semi overturning right there on the fine silver curve. It happened a little after two this morning, right before the early morning commute. Took crews a few hours to clean everything up. We do know that the driver in this case suffered just minor injuries. And let's take a look at traffic out there right now here during the six o'clock commute. This is 410 at Broadway and you can see right near the airport here. Traffic slow going in one direction, but we don't have any news on any tie ups, accidents or uh, construction to tell you about. Just looks like the six o'clock give and take out there. New at six, they served our country but needed help themselves. Today, a group of military veterans in Bear County graduated from Veterans Treatment Court. This afternoon at the county courthouse, four veterans who participated in this program are now graduates of it. The Veterans Court is designed to promote sobriety, recovery, and stability for veterans struggling with PTSD and traumatic brain injuries. We spoke with one veteran who says the program helped get his life back on track. The structure that this, pro this program provides is amazing. It helps you kind of go back into the military form of things and get uh, a structure in your life that, you, that we really need. Judges Jefferson Moore and Frank Castro preside over this specialty court. Stop the Bleed is having a major event next Thursday, May 19th. It's a training to help bystanders learn about something called bleeding CPR. So a lot of people are familiar with CPR, which helps the heart continue to beat. But bleeding CPR is for an injury situation when someone's bleeding to death. It's to get someone to EMS or surgeon to perform life-saving measures. Traumatic injuries is the number one cause of death in people ages 1 through 44. Experts say that a person can actually bleed to death in less than five minutes. We can stop the bleeding or slow down the bleeding so that there's a chance for EMS to get there so that EMS can start infusing blood. Um, that would be a major life-saving skill that any person could have. Oh my God. You can visit our website at KSET.com for information on this event, and you could also learn how to help save someone's life. And for this training, anybody can go and sign up. Let's take a look outside with live cam right now. 95 degrees out there. We're on a roll here, Adam, with these temperatures. A 90 degree roll. <laughs> yeah, it's the trend. It's going to continue. We'll even uh, I think add on a few degrees in the days ahead today. Made it up to 96 for the high temperature officially. The average high is 86. The record today, 101, set back in 1967. Looks summer like across the state today. 99 Lubbock, 90 El Paso, 96 Alpine, 96 the high temperature in Del Rio. Well into the 90s and even triple digits, Catula and Laredo briefly 100 degrees. As we go through the evening, we'll fall through the 90s, then the 80s. 10 o'clock, 81 degrees, midnight 76, cool enough pretty quickly this evening, but still above average for this time of year. We're going to talk about the record challenging heat on the way and who could see some storms and when coming right up. Also news around Texas, the Harris County Sheriff's Office is mourning the death of a deputy who was killed in a crash with an 18 wheeler. Happened yesterday when the patrol vehicle driven by 27 year old Robert Adam Howard reportedly drifted into the semi which had pulled over on the side of the highway. He later died at the hospital and the crash is now under investigation. Also in Houston, a 12 year old boy is recovering today after being shot several times while he was sleeping. 
It happened after a gunfight outside of a nearby nightclub. Investigators say between 80 and 100 rounds were fired, some of which were from an assault-style rifle. The Harris County Sheriff's Office says the boy is in fair condition, although he was hit several times. His mother was not injured. No word on who might be responsible, but police say at least five people may have been involved. KSAT 12 celebrates Military City USA, powered by USAA. New recruits entering the United States Air Force begin their journey in San Antonio or Military City, USA. Inside Joint Base San Antonio Lackland, you'll find the largest career field in the Air Force, Security Forces. Drop your weapon! So we'll start with career field history, move through ethics, our code of conduct, so that they understand a basic foundation of what it takes to be essentially a police officer in the military. Uh, once that's done, we'll start proceeding with uh, some more of our training and intensify training. Sir! Moving into things like deadly force, baton, trying to get them a real realization of what it's going to entail in the real world. After completing a series of intense training, the airmen integrate these crucial skills to protect the world's most powerful assets and people in the Air Force. After that, they will complete their training. Uh, most of them will PCS across CONUS, across the 50 states, or they will go to overseas locations where our missions will be vast, all the way from nuclear security down to um, integrated defense of scanning, um, checking identifications at the base, doing base security, all the way to patrol. Tonight on the Night Beat, kidnapped at an NBA game only to be sold for sex in a hotel out of state. Police say it happened to a Texas teenager. We're going to tell you what staff at local hotels are now doing to make sure that a similar situation doesn't happen here. Also, new photos from a gambling bust in San Antonio. The property police say they found and why one pastor says that some of it belongs in his church. New at six, a San Antonio boy has a way with words and will use those skills this week at the National Scrabble Competition in Washington, D.C. Ricky Rodriguez was diagnosed with autism at an early age. He sat down with our R.J. Marquez to talk about how the game has helped his focus and made him one of the rising Scrabble stars in the entire country. 19, 20, 29. It's not every day you get to go one-on-one -on -one with a Scrabble prodigy. I'm trying to get um, lots of points. 24. <laughs> okay. 12-year-old Ricky Rodriguez is in the zone, strategizing and putting the winning words together in his head. I basically, when it's not their turn, I try to search for my rack for a bingo. A bingo is when all seven tiles are used in one play. Ricky's done that before, and now he's taking his skills to a national tournament. And we had a regular Scrabble set, and he took that out, and he would start playing games against himself. His mom, Erin, says Ricky competed in his first big tournament when he was eight, and won third place a year later in Philadelphia. He's played in events across the country and even in Malaysia. So our quick game at his northwest side home, not much of a challenge. I'm starting to think we should just end it right here because uh, you already know who's going to win. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. Ricky is pretty humble, but Scrabble gives him confidence. He was diagnosed with autism when he was a toddler, and his mom says the game also helps him focus. His photographic memory, his word knowledge, his attraction to words and language and all that. His parents tell him his diagnosis won't hold him back, and playing Scrabble is all about fun, win or lose. We just try to focus on all the things he can do and learn. He is so cool when he loses or wins. So I just took on Ricky one-on-one -on -one in the official KSAT Scrabble Challenge of 2022. And after three rounds, he's beating me by 53 points. Needless to say, I think he's ready to go for this weekend. Reporting for the Northwest Side, RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. He's so all ready. Right. He I he love said, that. He's like, just RJ, give up, all right? Thanks for playing. We're good, all right. That's cute. <laughs> now we're taking a live look outside. This is Sky 12 over the Pearl, where you can see people are gathering there. And you notice how they're right near the trees, because that's where all the shade is, because, you know, and you don't that, really have a lot of clouds. And no. that splash pad down yes. there, that would be a place to be today, Adam. Oh, yeah, you got to enjoy the water and even the uh, area pools you have access to before the water gets too warm. We know what it feels like jumping in late August, early yeah, September. That it's, August bath. It's not the same as the pool temperatures this uh, time of year. All right, let's get right to the radar. But there's nothing locally around here, but you go between Fort Stockton and Ozona, just south of I-10. 
we have a thunderstorm. There's been a little bit of development in Mexico, but really not a whole lot. But that leads us to the whole weather pattern and what we're expecting into tomorrow. So West Texas will likely see some activity tomorrow afternoon and evening. Some of it could drift into parts of the KSAT 12 viewing area. But right now, big dip in the upper level flow, Pacific Northwest, that's where they have the action. And then out ahead of it in parts of the Northland. I mean, we're talking from Kansas northward into Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota. That's where the severe weather zone and main severe weather threat is. And this would be an ideal system. The one over the Atlantic that's moving westward. It's moving backwards in the atmosphere over the southeastern US. That's just a good rainmaker for parts of the mid-Atlantic and southeast. We're in the middle, wedged in the middle of those systems, but likely to have a, a few disturbances drift overhead by tomorrow afternoon and evening. Not necessarily in San Antonio, but for locations closer to the Rio Grande. Here's our future cast. Some clouds again to start the day tomorrow. Some gray in the sky and then a lot of sunshine by the midday and afternoon. Four or five o'clock. Thunderstorms likely to flare up in parts of Mexico and West Texas, and then they could drift our way and make it to Val Verde County by about 5, 6 p.m., maybe even Edwards, Kinney, Real counties, and Uvalde County thereafter. But they're unlikely to make it anywhere east of Lake e, Uvalde, Carrizo Springs, Crystal City. So San Antonio, unfortunately, I don't think we would tap into any of that moisture. And I do think the future cast is a little too aggressive in terms of the coverage of those showers and storms tomorrow. Nonetheless, whatever develops does have the slight chance of becoming the strongest severe thunderstorm. I mean, I kind of feel like that goes without saying these days. If a storm develops, usually there's at least the chance it could become strong to severe. The rest of us, slim to none in terms of rain chances. I mean, we're looking at 0% just about every day over the next seven days and get used to that blue sky. A lot of sunshine, 95 degrees right now. It feels like 95 because the dew point dropped down to 61. So we're really not all that sticky and muggy outside at the moment. It's that typical trend. Morning is extra humid by the afternoon. Those dew points drop off a bit and I think we'll see that every day here on out. Divine now at 98 degrees, Canyon Lake down to 87, Seguin 92, 93 in Holotus, 99 Carrizo Springs and Catula. Those are our hot spots right now. And here's our case at 12 hour forecast tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. 70 degrees, a fairly gray sky again around sunrise by the noon hour. Nothing but sunshine, 85 degrees and into the afternoon, a high temperature of about 96, a southeasterly wind for the most part at 10 to 15 miles per hour at times gusting up to about 25 miles per hour. Elsewhere across our area, Bulverde tomorrow, 92, 97 Floresville. Really, it's going to be very similar to the past couple of days, but into the weekend, a little bit warmer. Saturday, 97, that would tie the record. Sunday, 98, that would beat the record by two degrees. Monday, we're expecting 100 degrees, and that would beat the record by three degrees. And by the way, we do have that total lunar eclipse. We've been talking about it for the past few days. That Sunday night, totality from 1029 p.m. to 1154 p.m., just a few high thin clouds maybe drifting overhead. That's about it, so should be good viewing for that lunar eclipse Sunday night. When we have to put the record highs on the seven day, that's not good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A few times, yeah. That's, that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thank <Adam>. you. <laughs> So we can start to make our plans because the NFL is releasing its schedule. Yeah, you can start marking on your calendar the games you're looking at in the NFL. So today around 5 o'clock, NFL teams started to tweet out their home opener. Well, for the Cowboys and the Texans, that's week one, and they both obviously get to play at home. we got more on that coming up. Plus, the UIL track and field championships are going down up in Austin, and we've seen some great competition coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Lawford. It's a big day for the NFL and it's ravenous fans because tonight at 7, the 2022 NFL schedule will be released. Dallas Cowboys fans are eager to see the boys' 17 game schedule, which will kick off Sunday, September 11th at AT&T Stadium with the Buccaneers at 7.20 p.m. per the Cowboys Twitter account. Now, the Dallas Morning News is reporting the Cowboys will play at the Giants in Week 3 on Monday Night Football. In Week 12, the Giants will visit the Cowboys on Thanksgiving Day. That's via the New York Post. And the Dallas
Dallas Cowboys will play at the Eagles on Saturday, December 24th, Christmas Eve in week 16 per the Philadelphia Inquirer. Dallas will have nine home games this season due to the 17 game schedule. As for the Houston Texans, it's being reported by Pro Football Network. They'll play at the Bears in week three, at the Giants in week 10, and they'll host the Browns Sunday, December 4th in week 13, the return of quarterback Deshaun Watson. The Texans tweeted they'll kick off the new season Sunday, September 11th at NRG Stadium against the Indianapolis Colts at noon. San Antonio FC beat one MLS squad to advance in the U.S. Open Cup, but last night they fell to MLS side Houston Dynamo FC 1-0 in the U.S. Open Cup round of 32. San Antonio had a few good looks, but Dynamo keeper Michael Nelson came up with a clean sheet recording three saves. Lost to a very, very good MLS opponent. Um, you know, created a few high percentage opportunities, unfortunately. Um, we weren't clinical enough to put those away to give ourselves uh, an opportunity um, to potentially win that game. SAFC returns a USL championship play quickly, heading to Florida for a matchup with Miami FC on Saturday night at 6. The UIL State Track and Field Championships began this morning with Class 3A and 4A competition at Mike A. Meyer Stadium in Austin, and two long jumpers from Greater San Antonio area are returning as state champions. In the girls Class 4A competition, Komal Davenport senior Kiana Van Haren struck gold on her fourth jump of 19 feet 8 inches. She won by more than 12 inches. And in the Class 4A boys action. Somerset's Taj Jones capped his high school career with a narrow victory. He jumped 24 feet, three and a half inches, one half inch ahead of the second place finisher. He is the first track and field gold medalist in Somerset history. I have worked so hard for this this year. I've gotten up so early before school, after school. Like I've trained so hard to be come back here and pretty much get this gold medal. That was just a nail biter. It feels real good. It's good for my reputation. Uh, I just like my family, thanks my friends. All, all came out here. They didn't have to have a few kids from my school to skip school for me. So that's crazy. I just thank them. In Class 3A, Great Hearts, Northern Oaks senior John Hansen defended both his discus and shot put state titles from last year. He won the discus competition with a throw of 187 feet 7 inches, and he struck gold in shot put with a toss of 62 feet 9 and 3 quarters inches. It's cool. Um, I don't know how many people have gone back to back in uh, shot or disc, and so to do it is a big achievement for our school and for me. And so I just want to represent uh, the people who love me well, and I think I did that today. Hanson had his own cheering section full of family and friends called the Hanson Posse, complete with matching T-shirts. Andrew Seeley will have more from the state meet tonight on the night beat. That support is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's all about, man. Good stuff. <laughs> all right, thanks, Larry. Our KSAP Q&A is coming up next. We're going to bring you breaking news right now. This is from our Sky 12 camera. You can see there is a fire that's along the 6900 block of Border Brook. We're being told that this is an apartment complex that that's right near the Ingram Mall. We don't have any idea as to the extent of the fire, but you can see that there is at least one unit there a full of firefighters trying to fight that fire. But as you can see, there are lots of smoke in that area and you don't see a lot of traffic that's allowed along those streets. So just one thing to keep in mind. Yeah, we don't know at this point a cause of the fire, how many people may have been evacuated. That's certainly something that could change as crews work on trying to knock down these flames. But it looks like significant smoke coming from at least one of those buildings. Again, a west side apartment, 6900 block of Border Brook. This is not too far from Ingram Park Mall. Uh, we are sending a crew there, so we're going to gather some more information about what's happening here and keep you updated. And now let's go to our KSAT Q&A. Yes, my friends, it is Mental Health Awareness Month, and now more than ever, it's important to focus on this issue because so many people we know are in pain. Experts say that more teens, black and Hispanic males and females are committing suicide. So here's the question. How can we help? And today we're going to have somebody who can shed light on that and more. We have Dr. Christine Yu Moutier joining us. Uh, she is the chief medical officer with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Dr. Moutier, thanks for sharing some time with us today. I think when it comes to all of those different groups that Stephanie had just mentioned, the rates of young people wrapped mm -hmm. up in 
anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicide. That is incredibly alarming because that number is growing. So are, are there certain factors that you're seeing when it comes to what's driving more teens uh, to feel so trapped in some ways? We all have mental health to manage all of the time, but this has been a time, right, for all of us where uncertainty, feelings of isolation, and now coming out of the pandemic or the, our next phase, there's just a lot going on for different people, for different youth. And look, you know, for people who have any vulnerabilities towards depression, anxiety, a history of trauma, it can just really press upon the mental health and suffering of those individuals. So it really is a time like never before to learn how to have these more authentic conversations where we can check in with one another and really hear what's going on, allow them to talk, even just talking alone helps so much, let alone connecting to professional sources of help when necessary. Now, do you think it's just interesting that right next to you, we're showing pictures of people on, on their cell phones while we're talking about this. Um, do, do you, can you draw a parallel or, or can you explain how the pandemic affected this or what impact? Because we understand mental health experts are still trying to understand the impact that that had on so many people. But what have we seen so far? Well, right now, our latest CDC data tells us that four in 10 young people are talking about having experienced persistent sadness or hopelessness during the pandemic. And that is a higher level of, you know, rates of that, those kinds of distressing experiences than pre-pandemic. And we do think that already there had been increasing rates of depression and anxiety now, screen time is is a factor. We know that. And it, it's a it's kind of a double edged sword because it can be a source of connection. And some people are really actually sharing and receiving support for their mental health experiences. But others are not. And and the general feeling is that spending a lot of time on the screen time, which got accentuated during the pandemic, if you think about it, um, for all of us, let alone for our youth, that was in place of the usual protective kinds of activities like in-person school, in-person sports, um, supportive kind of connected experiences that young and young people and adults would have on a normal basis. So uh, there's a whole lot of factors, you know, financial strain, loss, um, the, the uncertainty and fears about the impact of COVID or, you know, various family circumstances. So there are many different factors. If you look at a societal level, increased rates of substance abuse, increased um, rates of purchasing new firearms into the home. There are a whole lot of factors that can affect the suicide risk of a population. But again, don't think that we are without the ability to, to protect our youth and protect each other just by checking in and opening, opening up that open dialogue. And I think part of that is certainly knowing what to look for, mm -hmm. right? I mean, when it comes to teenagers especially, there are a lot of big emotions during those years. And so I'm curious if you have any advice for parents on what to look for to say, OK, this is this is something different than what people may chalk up to normal teen behavior. When are there signs of a problem? I'm so glad you're asking this because for a long time I've been noticing that we write off too many signs of deteriorations in mental health to kind of normal teenage angst. And the truth is, while there are apps, it's a time of change and transition and the brain is developing actually all the way through the early 20s, the brain is still physiologically developing. But what I would say is if there are signs and expressions outside your usual, your child's usual patterns of behavior, and I know that's a really broad definition, but trust your gut instinct. If they are seeming withdrawn, their tone of voice is more, you know, hopeless. Um, they're talking in terms of feeling like they're a burden to others, feeling overwhelmed, but and not bouncing back. I mean, increases in substance use, certainly drinking, drug use, um, but also aggression and feeling more irritated, more easily angered. 
Um, if there are signs that their academics are deteriorating, their coach calls you and says, you know, they're not acting like themselves. Something is different. I would pay attention to all of that. And most of all, pay attention to your gut and rely on the other adults in your child's life to check in with them. But most importantly, try to open up that open dialogue in the home environment. I know it's not easy as parents, but really letting them know that you want to understand what their experiences are and be quiet enough so that they have space to talk about that. So let's also talk about treatment. Where can parents, where do you start that? Where can parent, what's the first number that parents can call to seek treatment, counseling, things like that? Yes, if you are not already connected to any mental health professionals, that is completely okay. You can always start with your pediatrician and they will tell you who they've you know, been referring to in the community and, and you know, who they have good experience with. If you have insurance, you can cert certainly start by calling your insurance or checking on the website and you know, putting in mental health professionals and put in a radius that you're willing to drive and, and be mm -hmm. ready to make some phone calls and, and really vet that if you have the kind of friendships and network within your community where you are able to talk about mental health, which is certainly happening more and more amongst workplaces and friend groups, then that's another place where we talk to each other about, you know, who we should go to okay. for this, that and other types of health conditions. And mental health is no different. Okay, Dr. Christine Umutier, she is the Chief Medical Officer with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Thank you so much for your insight today. We appreciate it. Thank you for highlighting this important issue. Absolutely. It. We'll be right back. All right, outside right now, 94 degrees, plenty of sunshine. Oh, yes. Not a whole lot of clouds, Adam. Oh, no, no clouds out there right now. We've got uh, nothing but sunshine locally, but those low clouds will fill in again late tonight, and especially early tomorrow morning. 95 degrees at the airport, 88 at 8 p.m., 10 p.m., 81. We'll be dropping off pretty quickly temperature-wise and then settling down near 70 by tomorrow morning. Storm chances for a few folks, some specific areas. We'll get into that along with the record challenging heat in just a bit. All right, it is Thursday, but before we talk thermometers, Gosh, we could use some rain, Adam. Oh, we sure could use some rain. It's only going to be for a few areas where we could get some as we get into tomorrow. So very specific rain chances. Otherwise, record challenging heat on the way. And we have the newest drought monitor. It is in. And actually, we're going to start with that. Take a look at the situation across our area and the rest of the state. And of course, the news is not good. But, you know, we really didn't see a big change compared to last week. And you look north and east of San Antonio toward Gonzales than LaGrange, Bryan College Station. You really see that drought fade away where we've had some rain even up into East Texas. But you go west of town, when I mean, we're talking Lakey, Sabinal, Uvalde, Hondo, Pearsall, Pleasanton, we have the exceptional drought in place, and that's the most significant drought category, according to the drought monitor. Across the state, almost 80%. We're talking 79% of Texas is considered in drought, and it is also exceptional as you get up near Lubbock and into parts of West Texas. So let's talk about our rain chances going forward. You know, we had a few thunderstorms in West Texas earlier, and I even showed you one earlier at six o'clock, but that has since dissipated. Big system is in the Pacific Northwest that dip that trough in the upper level flow out ahead of it. Good energy causing severe weather again in parts of the Midwest and parts of the Northland upper level low over the southeastern US. That's actually drifting in from the Atlantic. We're wedged in between these systems still under the influence of a ridge of high pressure, which is I think is going to strengthen as we get into the weekend. So unfortunately, no good forcing out there, no good features to help get showers and thunderstorms going. A few disturbances out west tomorrow could kickstart some activity. So let's talk about it with our future cast here. 7 to 10 a.m. tomorrow, we'll have some grayness in our sky and we'll have the clouds as we typically do in the morning. Then a lot of afternoon sunshine. We get to 4 or 5 o'clock. Storms should start to flare up in the mountains of Mexico, parts of West Texas. And even by 5, 6 o'clock, some of that could drift into Valverde County, maybe even down into Kinney and Maverick counties. And then going through the evening hours, leftover thunderstorms making their way toward Lakey, Uvalde, possibly even Crystal City and Carrizo Springs, but unlikely to make it any farther to the east. So 
San Antonio surrounding and surrounding communities. Odds are significantly against any of those showers or storms making it our way. Just a few of them likely to pop up farther to the west, closer to the Rio Grande and drifting into parts of the hill country and the slight chance of a severe storm or two. 95 right now. This is actually a time lapse of our sky, but we don't see any clouds moving overhead because we haven't had any overhead for the past few hours. Just a lot of traffic moving on the interstate there. 95 degrees dew point is 61. The dew points dropped off this afternoon as they often do, and that mitigates the heat index. So the feels like temperature is the same as the actual air temperature. And I do think that's going to be a very common situation during the coming afternoons, basically tomorrow all the way through the weekend and into next week, which is a good thing considering temperatures are going to go up just a little bit. But you look at the dew points at 60 Rio Medina, 57 Hondo, 63 Seguin. You notice some humidity out there, but we're not at the oppressive level of mugginess. Air temperatures, for the most part, low to mid 90s. Comfort 92, 92 in Converse, Divine 96. Stinson often seems to be running a little warmer than surrounding areas. Not exactly sure of the uh, reason could be calibration, but right now Stinson 99 degrees and Rio Medina at 94. Tomorrow morning we'll start the day right near 70 degrees, upper 60s for many of us, especially in outline areas, Castroville 68, even 66 tomorrow morning in Bernie and Bulverde. So a pleasant start to the day. Then by the afternoon, we make it well into the 90s again. 97 west side of town, Port SA area. Hello, just about 93, Floresville 97. I think around San Antonio about 96. A few of those border storms are possible. Then this weekend, we challenge those record highs. 97 on Saturday, 98 on Sunday, and back to 100 degrees by Monday. I do think a few records will fall. Aye. That's my reaction. Oh, exactly. <laughs> All right, we're back at it here. I've been uh, working on the replacing the thermometer to this instrument trio. We've got our hygrometer, barometer, and remember, I've been working on the thermometer. So let's get right to the video. The previously we talked about me blowing the glass, right? Blew the glass, made the bulb right there. And now the next step is to let the glass cool so I can actually touch it and then what I call evacuate the tube. It's important to turn down the heat a little bit and then slowly work that flame from the bottom up along that thermometer. We actually we're speeding up this video right here because it does take a little bit of time. That's not exactly convenient for TV, but work your way up. And what it does is that basically boils off or burns off any saliva that could be in the tube, any condensation, anything in there. For After you blow the glass, you can have some moisture mm. in that tube. You don't want that mixing with the alcohol. And that's actually one of the steps I didn't learn back in college. That's something experience taught me after running into some issues. So evacuating the tube was the next step. And then next time, the famous <laughs> yes. comes into play. We, uh, oh yeah, we know all about that around. Oh here. yeah, that's coming in <laughs> into play soon. All right, today's thermometer w winner. I, Anise. Anise. <laughs> it took me a second. I was like, Ste earlier I was like, help Steph, me out here. Yeah, Steph. I, yeah, help me out. Anise Velasco of San Antonio. Congratulations. Go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. So right. glad Caskey Cam is back. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank so. you. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Late night 911 calls had San Antonio police working to shed some light on what happened along this south side road. They found a Dodge Challenger partially submerged in what looks like a man-made pond near Research Plaza and South New Braunfels. Inside that car were a 21-year-old man and a woman. An argument between neighbors ends with one in the hospital. San Antonio police telling us that a man went to his neighbors with a knife and was making threats. So then the homeowner pulled a gun and shot that man twice. That's what police are saying. He was taken to the hospital in critical but stable condition. Emotions ran high ahead of the police contract vote. But while there were concerns over more SAPD spending. Every increase that we make is permanent and must be taken seriously. The new contract 
which runs through September 2026, changes officer discipline in several ways, most notably making it harder for fired cops to win their jobs back on appeal. The new subpoenas in naming Republican House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, Congressman Andy Biggs, Mo Brooks, Scott Perry, and Jim Jordan. According to the January 6th panel, the GOP congressmen have relevant information regarding what led to the deadly January 6th Capitol attack. Today, we mark a tragic milestone here in the United States. One million COVID deaths. The CDC is reporting that 40% of COVID deaths in January and February were among people who were vaccinated. Doctors say that may be because the vaccine's efficacy wanes over time. Right now, the FDA is considering a recommendation to encourage more people to get the COVID vaccine at the same time as when they get the flu vaccine, but the FDA has not announced a decision just yet. Well, it may not look like much, but it is a very big deal. This is the first image of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. It's called Sagittarius A star. The dark area in the center, that's the black hole. It doesn't give off any light, but the light you see circling the black hole is glowing gas. So scientists think that there is a black hole at the center of nearly every galaxy, but this this is the first photo of our galaxy's black hole, and it's four million times more massive than even our sun. It took more than 300 researchers from 80 institutions working with a network of eight different radio telescopes around the world over the course of years, yeah, <laughs> to capture that and confirm that image and discovery. Pretty cool stuff. To sum it up, yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, it's a really big kind deal. of a big deal. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching the News at 6. We'll see you on the Night Beat.